My name is Jenny Najis and I'm a convert and I'm from Denmark. I grew up in a small village, um, not that many people, small community, uh, mainly Danish, no really, not really any, uh, any kind of foreigners. Um, my mom was um, one of two foreigners, you can say, in, um, in my village. She's from the Philippines and there was another man as well, so they were the only two uh, kind of adding any ethnicity to the community. Um, so I grew up in a, in a small family, my mom, my dad, my sister and me went to school in, in the same place where I grew up for about seven years. And uh, then I moved on to uh, the neighbor city and continued my schooling there until I finished my, um, I think what you call primary education here in, in England. Um, yeah, my, uh, my mom and dad, they're both from a Christian background. My dad is from a Christian church. My mom was a Catholic, uh, from the Catholic church, and when she met my dad and married, um, and they, they were pregnant with me, uh, they decided that she would change to um, the Protestant church that, that he was from. So she did that, and I grew up in the local, uh, going to the local church where we lived. And I was in the church choir, I was baptized, I had my confirmation there. I mean, you know, our food would be different. We would have different food, we'd eat lots of rice, and my mom would have her friends from, um, with the same background as her coming to visit us. And we'd have, in the house, it would be two different communities coming together. And then, obviously, when I went to school, I would have my Danish friends, we would play. Um, so outside it was just, I didn't really feel that different. Um, but obviously in our house, you know, my mom being a Catholic, maybe her, her way of upbringing us was maybe a bit stricter or things to do or what was accepted, not accepted. That might have been a bit different, but otherwise. Uh, I, I was part of the church choir uh, when I was about maybe from 12 years old. Um, it was kind of, you know, when, when, you're, when you're a child, you want to go to things, you want to go for a sport or you want to go for some kind of dancing. So I did these things and then I was also in the, the choir. And I don't think my parents were specifically religious. Uh, we had Christmas and these kinds of events where we knew what it was for, like Easter, what happened on Easter, what, what Christmas was about for, for Jesus Christ. Our birthday, but it's not like we had a prayer or we they weren't they weren't orthodox in any way. I would say my mom she was probably she had that Catholic culture behind her that's quite strong, you know. Oh, you should get married, you should have education. These things that are quite strong with them, she would have, but I wouldn't say in a religious way. No. I would say when I would say when when I was younger from my mother's side, uh, there would definitely be a bit more of these words coming up, uh, especially with Easter, with uh, my mom's dad when he passed away. Um, she would mention things like, um, uh, uh, she had like an altar, you can say like her own corner in her bedroom, where she would have pictures of Virgin Mary, small prayer books, and um, with Easter, we would always gather around the TV. We would watch movies about the crucifixion, the the death of the Prophet Isa. Um, um, I wouldn't say not um, just with these kinds of events, these kind of days, holidays. It's actually quite funny because I was thinking about this leading up to this interview about the thoughts I'd had about Islam and how I knew about Islam when I was younger, and I actually. Um, used to play these games with my sister and I have no idea how it got to my head but we would play that we were Muslims and uh, one would be the wife, one would be the man and we would be all about, you know, that they wear a scarf, put on a scarf on your head and play um, and I don't know if it's from TV, maybe my parents had some kind of conversation where I heard the word Muslims um, but I was quite aware of that there were Muslims and they covered their head. Um, 
quite early on. When I got to our schooling system is a little bit different than England, but I guess it's equal to um, college here. When I got to college, uh, I had a normal schooling, friends, a school, um, whatever, normal kind of lifestyle. And I think that it was a combination of me always being drawn to this Islam, being a Muslim, what it was about, and also the fact that my mom's culture was different than my friends. Like my mom, she would be like, you know, um, you shouldn't, uh, you know, like alcohol, these things, you, should, you shouldn't be too, too involved in these things. And um, then you have the community outside that's all about these things. Um, and I think that's when I actually started um, thinking about what I thought was good for myself. And it wasn't necessarily about, oh, I should be a Muslim, because I don't think that that even striked my head. I just think that I was, um, it was the beginning of me trying to find a good life for myself. I would just be a bit confused about these things with my friends that I wasn't really agreeing on the lifestyle that they had. Uh, and I think that was the beginning where I was, I was like starting to be a bit, okay, I'm different, you know, this is not really for me. Um, I want something else, I don't know what it is, but I wasn't just angry, agreeing on, these, on, on, on certain things. So I just continued my school, finished my school, um, continued growing up, I went to, uh, to uni. Um, and I think actually in uni, that's when I actually first had my encounter with, uh, with Muslims. There were some girls in my class. Uh, so when we had our lunch break, you know, they had the, the whole halal thing going on with the, the, <laughs> the food. And when they discussed if they're going to go eat somewhere or it had to be halal. And I was like, what is this about halal? Um, when they had Ramadan, they weren't, they weren't eating. And I was like, that must be so difficult. Why, you know, why are they not eating? What's this whole thing about? And at the same time, they're extremely educated, well-spoken, really, you know, promising young women. Uh, so it was uh, quite interesting, you know, to see as well when I went home to their houses, to see how everything functions. And that's uh, some of the few friends that I actually made that were Muslims. Um, but it wasn't like, I wasn't talking to them about Islam, about being a Muslim or anything. It wasn't really in my mind. When it started to come into my mind, um, I mostly did research, like online, on books. Uh, I would ask people questions, but I, I've never been, uh, so, you know, friends with Muslims before. And these kind of school people were not really close friends. So I'd ask them things and stuff, but it was mostly inside me that things were going on that I was wondering, I was thinking and um, somehow it just started growing on me a bit because I've always been drawn to it for some reason while, since I've been small I've always been drawn to it maybe because it's uh, unknown or um, different but um, I started doing some research uh, I would look up uh, online uh, I would uh, borrow uh, library books. Uh, I would talk to uh, talk to people. Uh, I met a few other converted girls, and I wasn't wearing a scarf, so they can't see that. You know, they they don't know what I am, what I'm thinking. But I would just try and kind of <laughs> question them out them out a bit about why are you you know why are you a Muslim. Um, so slowly, very slowly, I started to just increase uh, my knowledge about being a Muslim, what Islam is, um, what it means, what the religion means, everything about being a Muslim, I was just really taken by it and I just started taking everything and I would just go to a website and I would just copy everything in my head and it just seemed so logical to me. Nothing was a problem. I could understand it perfectly. And I was like, this is uh, really uh, amazing. Um, every aspect of life it just embraces. And I think that coming from a Christian background, uh, 
when you know you have very similar points to Islam with the Ten Commandments that you shouldn't you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't drink, you shouldn't lie. Um, it's it's just as if Islam took over, and it just embraced it and took it to the next level of like to make it complete. Everything about your life was taken care of. Um, so it just seemed a bit too good. And uh, once, I think when I was at this stage, I was really getting nervous because I was like, oh, you know, what are you getting yourself into? Muslims aren't exactly popular, <laughs> you know. It's not like um, they don't have a good reputation, they still don't, if not even worse. So it w I was thinking, if I do this, you know, forget about doing it. I was like, don't even think about it. But if I even start thinking about this direction, changing my life. It's not going to be good. Uh, I'll get lots of trouble. My parents are going to make huge shit. You know, it's going to be a problem. No, I can't do that. You know, I can't do that. So I was like, you know, forget it. Don't start thinking about this. Just, you, you're just a bit, you're having a period some kind and just don't think about it. So actually, by kind of by force, by myself, I was like, no, don't think about it. Leave it. You're not going to start, uh, messing things up, making problems. No, you're not going to do that. So I left it and I had, in this period, I was like, I don't want anything to do with Muslims. Uh, I don't want to meet any Muslims. I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to think anything, a word that could lead to thinking about Islam. So I did that for a period and I started feeling very, 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 I just, I didn't feel very well at all. I felt really bad. It was hurting in my heart. And when I realized that it was actually gone to my heart, I was like, oh, you're in trouble, you know, <laughs> you're really in trouble. Oh, your mom and dad are going to freak, <laughs> you know. They're really going to, they're going to, yeah, it's going to be a problem, you know. So uh, after I kind of realized that I liked it, that I liked what I was experiencing, what I was kind of developing inside me, I continued a bit again. I continued just gaining knowledge. Um, I got a few, f um, a few more closer friends, you can say. I actually got to experience to go to a masjid, a mosque, um, and actually uh, wore a scarf that day. And I didn't know how to wear a scarf properly. It was probably a mess and I didn't know anything, but I went there and I just thought, this is just amazing, it's just amazing. There was no, not really a lot of people there, but I just felt peaceful. You know, you sit on the carpet and it was just very beautiful. The reason why, the reason why I was searching for something different is because I didn't feel that I remember feeling when I was uh, in college, is this really it? Is this, is this life? This is, is this really it? It didn't feel complete to me. Uh, it just felt like it can't be it. There must be more than this. Uh, especially, you know, when you come from the, the Christian church. So many times you would ask them questions. You wouldn't get a straight answer. I feel that being a woman, coming to Islam and discovering how Islam treats a woman really empowers you and, and gives you so much of freedom and it encourages you to do the best that you can in every way but at the same time protects you and it doesn't pressure you in, in ways that our mothers have been pressured uh, to, to, have a, to have a home, have the children, raise up the children, have a full-time job and everything is just laid upon them. And when I discovered Islam, I thought reading about the woman and also eventually the hijab, it just, it makes sense. When you come from a Christian Catholic background, there's two sides to it. There's the cultural side and there's the religious side. Now, the religious side is, it has, in a way, everything, but it doesn't really take 
it doesn't grab around it. Whereas when you, when you come to Islam, it really actually takes an action. It tells you, uh, for example, how when you earn money, you should pay these Islamic taxes, you should pay the poor rate. Um, it, it just takes it further. So that's one thing that led me to Islam. The, it just it completes it. That's why I actually decided to change, because it's not enough to say you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't lie, you shouldn't uh, steal. Uh, and, and people are like, yeah, okay. And they'll go and, you know, uh, stab someone or whatever. But um, it's different with Islam. There's, it just, I can't explain the way it just it, it embraces it and explains you. And it's so logical and it's all for the sake of you. There's this whole love bound around the religion that people might not see always, in, especially in the media and these things. But there's this... There's just so much heart with, with, with Islam, so that's, you know, that's all, there must be the reason why most people convert, especially for me. I remember, this is probably, you, I'm jumping a bit, but when I first time went to a masjid, and that was actually a, a Shia masjid, and they had uh, Ashura, and I was, I was just blown away, because Obviously, the, the room was parted, there was the women here and the men here, but you could kind of see the men here, and I could hear them. And grown-up women and men were crying their heart, hearts out. And I was like, this is not the Islam that you hear about. How can grown-up people cry? And then for someone that's not even here anymore. I mean, we don't even remember our, our, our queen's forefathers. Uh, so... It was, it's, everything about it was just so mind-blowing and extreme, especially in the beginning when a convert, when a revert, actually reverts to Islam. It's, ex it's very extreme, and um, you, just, you, just, you just want to know everything. And when I saw that, I was just blown away. So there's just so many things about the religion that actually, it just fulfills it. It takes it and makes it 100%. It doesn't leave you anywhere. You always have your rights, no matter if you're a man or a woman. And these rights coming from uh, Western society, they've changed. It's as if, you know, the rights that they have, that I used to have, I guess, they're supposed to be what's good for you. But when you actually turn it around and you start looking at it, it's just not, and it's not good for you. And it doesn't help you in any way. And it, it doesn't promote you uh, being a woman because uh, I can't speak for, for the man, but being a woman, it doesn't promote you, it doesn't help you. On the, on the contrary, it just uses you, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't give you equality at all. When I, think, when I decided, uh, one of my friends asked me, so, because they knew that I was interested, they're like, so what's up with it? Are you going to, what do you want? Are you going to do it? Or if you don't say anything, and I'm like, okay, let's do it. So I said my shahada. And after that, I was, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a constant development. But at that time, I was like, if I'm going to be a Muslim, I still want to be accepted in society. Uh, I don't want to um, create any problems for myself just because I'm a Muslim. So I wanted to dress a certain way still. But as you grow and you read and you develop your, your, your Islam, I decided, especially because Islam is all about modesty, uh, I quickly changed my uh, views. When I became a Muslim, I was, you, you know, you always de develop yourself, and I'm still developing myself. But at that time, it was an early stage, so I didn't want to change my my way of of um, my outside appearance, especially in front of uh, friends and family. And, and these things, but slowly as you, you, you read about what actually Islam says about hijab and the concept of hijab, not just the scarf, but the hijab for man and woman and what it does to a society, that's when I started, um, I started to develop my own hijab as well and uh, understand the, the, word, the meaning of modesty and uh, what it carries with it. So when I, when I had, when I, um, when I started wearing hijab, I actually uh, went on like a, a small shopping trip myself, and I bought things that I thought 
or this is going to make me still accepted uh, in society and um, yeah this looks really nice but then after a time I was like it's actually really hard to to dress yourself inside what you believe in and still be fitted in society so um, I just interpret it the way I do. I wear what I feel is, is uh, I can accept. Bait TV, the holy household for every household. Ahlul Bayt have been praised by Allah, glorified and exalted in the Holy Quran. They are the family of the Holy Prophet. And what can be an, an, an easier path to achieving guidance than through them? whom Allah has described as So if that is where purification lies, it is through them that it will be easier to get guidance. And hence, a channel like this, which concentrates on the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, which are the pristine teachings of the Holy Prophet himself, peace be upon him and his progeny, will inshallah lead us to guidance. Of course, it goes without saying that such a channel will need financial support nothing is achieved without financial backing and so a contribution of this nature modest in some but it may be a major contribution in the eyes of Allah glorified and exalted because it is all leading us to seek seeking proximity to Allah glorified and exalted and 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 his promise is that he those who spanned in his path he he rewards them in in multiplied f fashions and, and this is our prayer, that may all those who help to keep the channel alive be amply rewarded by Allah, glorified and exalted. <laughs>
عيناي ما تمعها بس يمي صار الحزن ميداني وجار دم عجفاني صار الحزن ميداني وجار دم عجفاني Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said, A caller will call out on the day of judgment and say, O oh people, lower your gaze until Fatima passes by. Ahlul Bayt TV the holy household for every household. Actually, um, told my mom and dad that I was uh, going to be a Muslim on Christmas Day. Yeah, it just I, it just bursted out of me, <laughs> and um, my mom was actually cutting up the the turkey, and uh, she she just she just she just was extremely shocked. She thought she had lost a daughter, and. Um, Oh no, she's going to be like, you know, what we hear in TV and no, 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 that can't be true, that can't be true. She kept saying to me, you don't have Muslim blood in you, why would you want to be a Muslim? You know it's, it's going to be difficult for you in your life. And she said, well, let's talk to you, your father. And my dad came and she told him what I've said. And uh, he actually just left the house without saying anything and he went for a walk and uh, he never takes a walk. so. I, understood what I mean that I was really not that great but um, I think because it was the day of Christmas they uh, wanted me to have a nice evening like always so they came to me and they said if that's what you want uh, we accept it we we care for you we love you and as long as you're alright we're fine with it so that's actually how that ended when I actually broke the news to them uh, I think wearing a scarf, being a female, was more difficult because obviously it's going to be much more um, visible what I actually am. Um, but alhamdulillah, I don't think I. I think I've had um, a very good approach to it. Um, when I when I when I told my mom that I was going to wear a scarf. Uh, Besides being a Muslim, she thought that this was just, you know, it's quite heavy on top of me being a Muslim, that, oh, I'm also going to wear a scarf. Uh, so she said to me in the beginning, uh, if you're going to wear a scarf, uh, you can't come home. I, I won't be your mother. I, I can't be your mother if you're wearing a scarf. It's, you have to take it off. If you don't take it off, don't, don't show your face. Don't, don't come home. I was on the phone. And uh, I said to her, "It's okay. Uh, I understand what you. I understand why you're saying it, and um, I have chosen. But it's okay. I understand you. It's okay if you don't want to talk to me." And she hung up. 
And three days passed and then she actually called me again. And that kind of, it was kind of a conversation saying that, okay, okay, wear your scarf. Uh, she didn't, they, they don't really understand or like it, but they accept it. When I was um, reading about Islam, I knew there was two different, main different um, um, directions. And my, um, my idea of the two directions and also what I kind of was told by people was that there was the Sunni and there was the Shia. And uh, the Shia were um, not that good. <laughs> Um, so I didn't know much about it. So for me, when I became a Muslim, I didn't really choose. At that time, I had actually friends from both sides and uh, both trying to give me books and these things. Um, so I was just confused. I wanted to read myself. When I started praying, I did. I, I, I prayed as a Shia, uh, I downloaded a manual of how to pray and I just kept that beside me and, um, until I kind of could pray. So I actually prayed as a Shia first. I didn't consider myself a Shia, I would say, for a long time. Um, and I think that you can't always say things with words that, oh, I'm, I'm going to be a Muslim, because I think that I was a Muslim before I even knew it oh, I'm going to be a Shia, because it's something that develops in you, it's something that you, um, as you gain knowledge, as you, as you learn, all these things develop in you. So I would say becoming a Shia is something that's grown in me. The more, I've, uh, the more, the more it's grown to my heart, I would say, the stronger I went to this direction. I've always been open. I wasn't... Uh, differentiating too much between what is what. And in the beginning I was even quite, you know, um, does it even matter? But um, the more I gained knowledge, I actually went to the more Shia side and I actually started practicing much, much more. The thing with Islam and Shia Islam is that Islam is perfect. There's nothing about it that you won't be able to understand. Uh, there's a guideline about everything. But the thing about, and what takes you to just a different place, is when you come to Shia Islam, there's two sides of it. There's the, there's the historical side of it, uh, and then there's the more spiritual, um, emotional side of it. Uh, so once you combine these two, uh, it just, it takes you to Shia Islam. Um, there's a huge heart behind being a Shia, um, which I believe is why and why we are here today, why our Islam is like it is. It's preserved. So the Shia, the, the Islam that we have today is still beautiful. It still has the, the messages of fighting for your rights, fighting against uh, injustice, um, uh, uh, seeking knowledge, all these amazing um, uh, messages are kept. With regards to Shia Islam, the thing is that uh, when the Prophet, peace be upon him, was um, going, going to leave this world, uh, obviously he had decided that Ali was, was going to um, continue and um, I just think that the whole process of this is filled with so much heart and there's so much more than just, uh, there's a love bound to this and I think that's why people's world cry because it hurts them so much and at the same time it just, it saves us in every way. Um, so when you read these things, these stories, these narrations from that time, it really touches your heart and you cannot close your eyes to it. It was a combination of it just going to my heart so much that I could just cry out of pain. And then at the same time, when you watch 
grown-up people at the age of your parents hysterically crying how can you not I have to be honest and say I actually had to read it uh, several times it was a lot of um, a lot of things to take in and a lot of different names that I didn't know anything about so I researched it and researched and I actually read the same things over several times to actually be able to understand it um, but when, once, I actually <clears throat> once I actually understood what they went through and what it means to be a follower of the Shia, that's when, you know, it, it was completed. I was a Shia by heart. It doesn't mean that I didn't officially choose it before, but it's something I feel that I can't call myself a Shia before it actually went in here. Um, so it's something that, I don't know, it's something that grew in me. It doesn't mean that you don't take the decision before or after or uh, being a Muslim before or after. It doesn't mean that you're not a Muslim before you actually said it out loud. But it's something that grows in you. And sometimes you're just not aware that I'm actually a Muslim already, you know. Um, I just need to say the words I need to say to be a Muslim. Uh, on the internet, it was, I would, I would basically just Google. I would just Google it and just look at all different sorts of websites, uh, forums. Um, I would go to libraries, sit for a bit, and I would read stories of other people um, um, becoming a Muslim, um, what it, their stories, these things. Um, I had read books about going from Christianity to Shia, uh, Muslims going from one direction to another direction. Um, so quite a different um, different different kind of books uh, with different kind of subjects some say when they convert uh, they convert after reading the Quran I don't think for some reason it that wasn't it wasn't like the stone that took me to Islam but it was it was a part of my research definitely because obviously I come from a, a Christian background so I have a Bible as well so obviously you have these two books now Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I alas, I Allah is the nosy, is the bamiyati, is noun. Alif la mim ra. Ya ya Allah, the alvune, the altseeni. Dere er den fullkomne bogs vers, og det som er åbenbart for dig, min herre, er sandheden. Men de fleste mennesker er ikke troende. Since I've been, since I've been a young child, I've always, uh, when I've been in some kind of, you know, when I've been sad as a child, I remember very clearly that I would do prayers in my bed um, and all the way to when I grew up not constantly, not every day but if I would get really sad I would definitely I would just feel that there is something and um, this is my last thing, I'll try this now and um, I actually remember one time uh, that, ha that it was an episode that meant a lot to me uh, my dad, he had, um, he had lost something very precious to him and uh, he was really upset and I was upset because he was upset and uh, I actually um, I actually made uh, a small prayer inside myself on my couch and it was subhanallah the next day the thing was back and I was a hundred percent sure that this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has helped me it's I would say um, in some areas more than others. Uh, I remember especially reading about uh, in Christianity that the women used to cover um, the whole thing about going to church. There was a certain way of doing it. Women were not allowed the same things or sit the same way pl places as men or sometimes not even allowed to come in. Uh, so in these ways I was definitely comparing to, okay, so a woman from Islam uh, it's all covered up, uh, probably she doesn't have any rights. So I read about it and then I would compare her. I came to England about two years ago and I, I came um, for marriage. Um, I, had, uh, I had been uh, thinking about marriage for some time and since my parents are not um, Muslim parents that um, go and find you a partner or 
you have this huge community that can just uh, help you. Um, I actually um, started um, writing with uh, my husband on a marital site, a marital, Muslim marital site, site website, and um, I came here um, to uh, to meet him and to get to know him better than what we've already uh, got to know each other over mail. Uh, and I came here to, um, to meet him, and after being in England for two days, uh, we actually did the nikah, the akhid, and um, my future became England. So after about a month, I moved here, and I've been here ever since. First of all, the marriage completes the half of your dream, so um, I wanted to, to, to gain that as well. And then second of all, um, as any other human being, you'd like to have a, a life partner. Um, um, I didn't expect to, to move to England. Uh, I didn't expect to move anywhere, actually. Uh, but um, I think, as I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He chooses your, your partner. And uh, He chose my husband and England to be the, the place to reside. Uh, his family was extremely welcoming, uh, especially being a convert. You don't know, like, he comes from a different country, a different culture, and you're moving to a complete different country. Um, so I didn't really know what to expect. I just really tried to um, to ta take a, you know, a good grab around what we had gotten to know about each other. Um, and um, I think the fact that his family was so open to me and um, proud of me in a way, uh, obviously was just a huge plus, um, made me feel more welcome, uh, made everything a bit more easy. The society we live in today and so much going on in so many different countries in the world, the message that you get from Imam Hussein salam, and his Alul Bayt is so usable today. You can use it even, even today. You can actually use his message about fighting against oppression, fighting against, uh, against um, injustice, no matter how many people you are, how many people you are against. These uh, legacies are universal and eternal, you can say. Um, so when you, when you actually discover the whole story of the al Bayt salam, Imam Hussein salam, what they went through, what the women went through, how big a role model they actually can be, even though it's been so many years since this has gone on, you can completely relate to it. You can take it in your everyday life. You can, you can take it in, in your life and actually remember it and act upon the message that they left for the people is something that you will always be able to to have in your heart that you are able to fight against oppression you can always stand against injustice no matter how, where, how many people you are where you are and who you are against um, the fact that he actually left a, com a complete ummah um, a complete people still commemorating on him, remembering what he went through, living after his message is amazing. It's m maybe a little bit before the whole um, happening of Kabbalah, but the, um, the episode where the, the Prophet uh, called over um, Hussein alayhi salam when he was uh, just a small boy, and he calls him over and he sits him on his lap and he starts weeping. And then he calls over Hassan alayhi salam to his other lap and he weeps. And then 
the whole thing about that he actually knows what's going to happen to them, even though it's so, so many years ahead. He knows, and it hurts him. That's something that definitely stays with me. Two innocent children that's done nothing wrong. And then they come from the prophets, peace be upon him, from his family. That can happen to them. And that he knows it must be extremely painful. <coughs> I'm not the mother yet, so I don't have that motherly love in me yet, but it's, it's just, it's, a, it's like a heart that's getting crushed. That's how it is. The thing with the women of Kabbalah is that they were, they were so brave. Um, the fact that they were dragged through uh, dirty sand with no shoes, screaming, not being able to help the men that they love, the young men that they love, their children being everywhere, being captured, being kept in prison for years, dying in prison, not even being able to mourn for their children. It must be like a rock that's on your heart. You won't even, you're not allowed to lift it. You're not allowed to do anything uh, until the day when you're actually released. Where you can, you haven't even cried for the people that you want to cry for. And when you're released, you can finally do it. And the fact that a, ho that a whole people were left because they didn't, did, who is going to cry for Imam Hussein alayhi and his whole elevator alayhi and that they left the whole people that today still mourns about them. This is something about Islam we don't see in TV. We don't get this beauty. It's like an inside thing. It, when, once you get to it, you are amazed. Because this is not what you think about Muslims. When you hear about Muslims, this is not the image that we get. So it's a beautiful thing that's just hidden away a bit. How can you not... If you follow the Sunnah, which is th the path of the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, then you're still following the Sunnah when you're following Al Bayt, because Al Bayt is the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him. It is the Sunnah. So it's not, in a way, it's quite logical. The thing is that, um, especially when, um, when you're on a researching level, uh, not just me, but other people I know as well, you can, you can sometimes ask a question to a group of Muslims. And they won't. They don't want to reply it. They don't want to um, explain it, and they don't really have any proof for it either. And then you can go to another place. If they don't have the proof, or they don't, they can't remember it. They will get it for you, and they will make sure that you actually understand what they're saying. And then you can take it with you if you want. I think as well that when you discover the two different religions, there is a beauty over Islam and there's a beauty over the people that follow it. They have this uh, light over them, this love inbound in their presence. And this, this comes from the, the legacy that was left for them. Bait TV, the holy household for every household. La Baik Allahumma la Baik. La Baik Allahumma la Baik. La Baik la Sharika la Baik. La Baik la Sharika la Baik. Inna alhamda. Inna alhamda. Wa ni'mata. Wa ni'mata. La ka wa mu.